All right, well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, this is a discussion of the, a new working group we've created in the Kubernetes open source uh, community, uh, and we're focused on device management. Um, my name is John Bellameric, I'm from Google, and uh, um, these are my two co-chairs. Yep. My name is Patrick Uli, I work for Intel. I've been the original author and architect, if you want, of dynamic resource allocation before it became a working group. So I've been driving it forward for a few years now. And I'm Kevin Clues, I work for NVIDIA, uh, and I started working with Patrick in the early days on this as well, uh, mostly to push forward the NVIDIA use cases for, for DRA. So what is uh, the working group device management and why, are we, why do we exist? I mean, the, the, the short answer, this is our sort of mission statement, it's enabling uh, simple and efficient configuration sharing and allocation of accelerators and other specialized devices. So this grew out of uh, discussions. DRA has been worked on for a few years, as Patrick was saying, but we realized that we, we needed a place in the community um, to kind of bring together all the use cases and all the different vendors and all the different stakeholders. So back in um, KubeCon EU um, earlier this year, uh, after those discussions, we decided to form a working group. Um, and the primary thing we're working on is DRA right now, and we may disband after DRA is complete, but there are potentially other um, areas that are within scope, so we'll make that decision uh, in a year or two when we've finished what we're working on. Um, in any case, uh, it's a joint effort between a bunch of different SIGs, and um, I do want to emphasize that although our primary use cases, because of where our uh, market is today, is around GPUs, um, this also includes NICs, uh, FPGAs, even network attached devices. Um, mental model is usually cards in a, in, a no, in, a, in, a, in a box, but it actually can be other things as well. So as I said, DRA is the main thing we've been focusing on, and what exactly is, is this dynamic resource allocation? I think the easiest way to conceive of it is sort of these, these four parts that are on the screen here. One is an API, a new Kubernetes API, which vendors and, uh, can use to describe their devices. So rather than just saying this is, we have five NVIDIA GPUs, which is how we would do it, say, today with device plugin, um, we have a much richer uh, API for describing the devices, adding a bunch of metadata and um, inf other information about, about the devices and how they're connected and interconnected within the node. Um, the, the flip side of that, um, is the a new Kubernetes API for users to make requests of those devices. So this is really the same pattern we had already in Kubernetes with device plugin. Device pu pu plugin published basic information about the number of devices you had. You could use your, your, your re requests and limits to ask for a number of those devices. But the API there was very thin. It was basically just a name and account, you know, as an extended resource, and then maybe node labels um, uh, w w compose the entire API, and it didn't offer a lot of flexibility in the kind of um, devices you could represent in that model, uh, it, nor in sort of the way that you could ask for them. So as an example here, you can see, rather than asking for, you know, an NVIDIA GPU, you can say, I want an NVIDIA GPU with at least 30 gigs of memory. And that could that request could be fulfilled by a node that's got, you know, A100s or H100s, uh, and you don't have to change your, your request. So part one is how you describe the devices, part two is how you request the devices. Of course, that means we need a scheduler. The other sort of big change we made in addition to making that API more expressive, those two APIs, we changed the algorithm so that the choice of which devices get assigned to your pod is done in the scheduler rather than in the driver on the node. So device plugin makes that decision on the node of which specific devices are, are chosen, whereas DRI makes that, makes that decision in the scheduler. And that allows us to add additional logic, scoring, and satisfy those sort of underspecified requests in part two. And then part four, of course, is we have to actually actuate this. We have to, we have to plumb the devices into the pods and containers. And so that that's, requires a new API on the, uh, on the, on the node side. So I now do have the honor and the pleasure to announce that DRA actually is beta in 132.
The corresponding pull request got merged middle of last week, well before cold freeze, that's a new one for me, and it hasn't caused any problems, so it just stayed in. Um, what that means in practice is now two things. We are making a promise that this beta API will be in Kubernetes for at least three releases. Um, at some point, that's the guarantee, that's the stability guarantee. We may keep it a long bit longer before we replace it, when it may even be available beyond that. But the key thing is, if you have been worried about using DRA because it was alpha, now is the time to really look at this API and start using and start asking your vendors for support for DRA because it is now beta. Um, it's not turned on by default. That's another thing that Kubernetes does with new API groups. They are off by default, so you need to work with your cloud providers or local deployments to get this feature enabled. But these discussions are now also ongoing. GKE, I think, will support it. So we are fine on that front. Um, the feature gate is the other aspect that you need to enable. So there are two things that you need to flip, and but that, that is now possible. The other, the other good thing of going beta is that we are now allowed to backport bug fixes. So if we find something in master that's broken, we can backport to 132, 123, whenever we find an issue and, and fix it also in that stable supported release. We couldn't do that earlier in alpha because there's a, a guideline against backporting uh, features of bug fixes for alpha things. So that's a good milestone to reach and I think it will good, give us a good base to move forward because if we see here on this slide, we are not yet done. What got merged uh, in 132, uh, well, I, I mentioned the beta promotion. Let's go into more details what actually got promoted. It is what we called structured parameters. The API is almost the same as the one as it was in 131. So moving from the alpha to the beta is very simple. There's one small field that changed, but it's, uh, it's trivial. You will see it if, you, if you're writing a DRA driver. Um, we removed one for in 132, the classic DRA. That one was kept around because some people were still doing work with it, but ultimately we decided that because it's not supporting cluster auto scaling, we can't support it any further and it doesn't have a good future in Kubernetes, so it got, it got removed. Um, some other things related to beta creation, you probably won't notice, but there were some changes in, in API limits, uh, the size of your cell expressions, the cost of cell expressions. These are just basically things that we had to do for beta. It's, it's probably not even usable, visible, so let's ignore that. Perhaps worth calling out is that scheduling is quite a bit faster. The initial implementation in 131 was really just about doing it correctly, very simplistic and uh, with a lot of profiling and looking at bottlenecks. Uh, in some scenarios, I was seeing a speed up of almost 16, a factor of 16. It's not always that much faster, but throughput is, is certainly better now. So if, if you had concerns about performance, it might be a good thing to reevaluate and, and check out uh, the, the 132 implementation. So other things that we got into 132 is the first, uh, first thing, uh, a, a cap and an implementation from, from someone else. We are certainly hoping more to get more of these caps done by, more, by a broader community now that it's, the core is stable. Um, and a, alongside with that, the, 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 this one cap was about resource claim status, in particular for network devices. So you can post from the DRA driver the IP address assigned to some, some additional network card for the pod. Um, and then the other thing is also for uh, relevant for beta is that we now have a good plan. We have all the code in 132 for the cluster autoscaler to support DRA. And there is a prototype in the autoscaler code itself that uses that. So we, we are expecting cluster autoscaler support for DRA shortly after the, the 132 release. So that's the in-tree part. The out-of-tree part is that we, of course, need DRA drivers, because without drivers, DRA doesn't do anything. We do have the example driver that we are updating as a, as a reference for potential DRA driver developers. Uh, like 
the Intel DRA drivers and the NVIDIA DRA drivers, both drivers are currently based on the 131 Alpha API. They still need to be updated to support beta, at which point uh, they'll probably only support the beta. There is no good way to support alpha and beta in the same driver, so you would need, we would need to maintain different, different reasons, but that pain is going away until, uh, as soon as we all focus on, on the beta API. Um, and this is planned for the Intel DRA drivers for GPUs, Gaudi and QAT, and as well for, for the NVIDIA uh, drivers. Then in progress for the first time is, is a, a driver that does, uh, handles networking, and that is under exploration. So that's, that's a bit less mature than the other drivers, and the same for the Google TPU driver. And with that, I think we can move on to next steps. Sure, so, so as Patrick said, um, we're, we're nowhere near done. Um, what we've done in 132 in the beta is what I would consider a minimum viable product. It's, it gets us DRA out there, it gets us able to do the drivers, it gets us some additional functionality beyond what you could do in device plugin, but um, there's a ton of work to do. And so part of the idea behind these maintainer track sessions is to encourage people in the community who have use cases uh, and who have an interest in a particular topic to come and join us. And this is a sample of some of the things we're working on. So we talked about those four, four parts, right? The claim API, that's our way to request things. Well. We have a few ways to request things right now, but there's a lot of ideas about other ways you can create um, uh, these, these requests that either add constraints. So one of the constraints we support now is to, say, align a GPU and a NIC on the same PCIe route, but um, there are other kinds of constraints you might want to request in, uh, uh, across devices that you're asking for for a pod. Uh, another way is, is sort of a aggregate requests. So uh, right now you can ask for a, a number of devices or all the devices that meet a criteria on a node, but we have use cases or interest. We'll see how strong the, the use case is, but we have interest in being able to specify requests like, you know what, I'll take any NVIDIA GPU or any, I'll take anywhere between one and four NVIDIA GPUs as long as in aggregate they have more than 120 gigs of memory, right? So that's one way to underspecify a request. And when you have scarce resource availability within your cluster, then that, that flexibility can allow the platform to meet your request uh, in multiple ways, which makes it more likely you'll get scheduled. Um, so there are a whole bunch of ideas around that and around aligning native resources. So tons of work there. Similarly, in the publishing of the capacity or the uh, advertising of the devices, that's I think it was part one in the, in the description. That's our slice API, resource slice API. And today we have a very uh, simple model. It's basically, here's a list of devices and a bunch of metadata about them. But um, we have a couple of uh, different ideas around how to model things like uh, NVIDIA MIG or valid TPU topologies in, in Google TPUs. So the idea here would be that you can dynamic, you can take a request that says something like, I need uh, an NVIDIA GPU with four gigs or more, and the platform can say, oh, you know what, I, I only have these giant machine, giant ones, but these are reconfigurable. I'll part create a new partition for you, and I'll give you that new partition so that you're only consuming a small piece of it. And that can be done dynamically and heterogeneously across a node. Um, so that's super interesting. We, we hope to get that into alpha in 133. We have a whole bunch of similar uh, device models that, that, that could be interesting. Um, so I won't go into all of these things, but you see the point is that we're just really getting started with what we have in 132, and we would love help. Um, I think my next slide is exactly that. Yes, we would love help to uh, help move those things forward. Um, we have um, a bunch of them in process, and we're working over the next a uh, few weeks and months to prioritize and identify the next things we'll be doing in, one, in 133. And of course, the more of you that come and join us, uh, either with use cases, not you don't have to be writing code, but come and help us inform us as to what will be useful to you uh, to, in your workloads um, would be super helpful. So there's a PDF of this deck on the sketch, and all of these links should work there. So uh, I'd love it if, um, if you could come join us. 
With that, uh, Kevin is going to dive into and show you a deep dive of how, uh, how DRA works with NVIDIA GPUs. Yeah, so a lot of you may have seen me give talks on DRA in the past and the different APIs that we used to use DRA to both select and configure GPUs behind the scenes uh, once you're given access to them. The, the purpose of this is really just to show now that we have this stable API in 132, what does this API now look like? Because it's changed quite significantly from the original classic DRA and even through some of the different iterations of structured parameters that we had. Um, and as we talked about at the beginning, you know, DRA itself is a new way of requesting resources that has been available as an alpha feature since 126. And it's only now uh, reached beta. And one thing I always want to highlight is that it provides an alternative to the count-based interface of, for example, NVIDIA.com GPU2. It's not meant as a replacement for the device plugin API. It's really just an alternative to use it. So I see in the future that, you know, at least for GPUs, most things will migrate to, um, to, to a DRA-based system, but that, doesn't, that isn't necessarily true for all types of devices. So it's just important to always point out that DRA is meant as an alternative, not a replacement. Um, and it really does just provide a much richer API for requesting and, and configuring resources. Uh, and it was inspired by the persistent volume API. So for those of you that are new to this and haven't actually seen examples of what DRA looks like, if you are for, uh, familiar with persistent volumes, it should look pretty familiar. Um, <clears throat> so just really quickly before I go through and show some of the YAML um, for how you make use of DRA, both in terms of advertising GPUs from the node side and then you know, requesting them uh, on, the, on the claim side. I just want to talk about some of the limitations that DRA um, overcomes from what the device plugins used to provide you. Um, one of the big ones is that you can dynamically subdivide large devices, uh, which was just, uh, for the most part, not possible with the, with the standard device plugin. Um, and you can also configure devices individually. So there's an API that I'll show a little bit later on, later on that, you know, in addition to being able to select a, a specific device, you can also say, once that device has been given to you, how do you want it configured? Do you want it configured to be able to share via time slicing? Do you want it to be able to be configured um, sharing, with sharing via a technology we have called uh, MPS or other types of um, configuration that, that might emerge in the future? Um, um, and then, yeah, just being able to share them in general. The, the, the main thing that DRA gives you that device plugins don't is that there's a separation of declaring what devices you want from actually how you consume them. And so, you know, you kind of say, here's, a, here's a, a, a GPU that I want, and then in individual containers or individual, um, you know, containers either within the same pod or across pods, you can reference that one single uh, device and know that you're going to be sharing it in a controlled way. Um, <clears throat> Um, and some of the, the, the foundational new functionality that it, that it brings is allowing you to have, you know, workload-specific accelerators uh, via the different sharing configurations that you want to apply. Um, specific to NVIDIA, we have dynamic MIG uh, and TPU use cases that are enabled. Uh, and one of the, the, the brand new features that we never even uh, properly solved for in classic DRA is the ability to do alignment of different devices uh, using a concept that we call uh, match attributes. And in the future, we might even have more sophisticated ways of doing this. And I'll demonstrate this a, a little bit later on, what it, exactly I mean by that. Um, and also the consumption of multiple associated devices as a unit. So, you know, you could imagine building a driver that said, you know, I know that I always want to bundle this NIC with this GPU, so I'll just advertise that as a single device. Uh, and that's what you ask for, and that's what you get. It's also relevant to, to things like making sure that you always get two GPUs connected by an NVLink. You could advertise those as a bundle, and then when you request it, that's what you get, rather than having to request two separate devices and somehow leave it up to the scheduler to figure out how to link those together. Um, in terms of advertising resources, this is what it kind of looks like. Uh, on the right, you have um, the, the, the DRA uh, resource driver itself. Uh, it consists of a daemon set uh, of a Kublet plugin whose sole, not sole purpose, but main purpose is to advertise uh, this in-tree object called a resource slice which enumerates the set of devices uh, that you want to be able to request access to inside a, um, a resource claim later on from within your pod spec. Uh, this resource slice is, you know, at the moment, mostly consumed by the Kubernetes scheduler, and it uses this to, when it sees a request come in for a device, it can consult the resource slices that exist across the cluster, pick a node that has a device of the type that you're asking for, uh, and then schedule your pod to that node. 
Um, but it's also consumable by uh, cluster autoscalers uh, in the future once we have uh, support for that merge, which Patrick alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, on the request side, uh, this is, uh, for the most part, what it looks like. Again, on the right, uh, you have the pod spec, uh, and there's a new section inside the, uh, the, the resources stanza from your pod spec called claims, which points at a separate object called a resource claim, which is used to provide all of the selection and configuration criteria for the device that you're trying to get access to. Um, and the resource claim is then, you know, consumed by both the scheduler and the kubelet in order to, uh, you know, um, actually do the allocation of the devices to your pod and as well write the, the status back um, um, for, the, for the kubelet to consume when the, when the time is appropriate for that. Um, so what does this device enumeration look like? Um, this is an example of what it would look like uh, in terms of NVIDIA GPUs. So uh, the main thing to note on this is that, you know, at the top we see that, you know, this is a resource slice that we're advertising. Uh, it's associated with some specific driver. In this case, it's the gpu.nvidia.com driver. And um, what it does is it enumerates a named list of different devices that have a set of attributes and capacities associated with it. And the example I'm showing here, I'm just going to highlight uh, two of those attributes and capacities. Uh, one is the model name for this GPU. Uh, in this example, I'm showing a GH296 gigabyte uh, GPU. This just happened to be the machine I was running on when I uh, generated this. Uh, and you know, underneath the capacity section, you see that it has 96 gigabytes of memory. Um, I'm not going to go into the details today of why we separated this notion of attributes and capacities out, but from, from, from at a high level, things that you could imagine being consumed uh, by an end user get put into the capacity section, and things that um, are kind of just generically associated with the device you put in the attributes section. <coughs> um, so on the flip side of this, uh, you know, something that's also install, installed by the specific driver itself is this notion of a device class. And so the device class that I'm showing here um, has the name gpu.nvidia.com. Um, that's different than the driver name. Most of the time, you'll probably have these two being called the same, but they don't have to be called the same. Um, and within that, you write uh, the cell expression um, that defines what it means when you request devices of this class, what default properties does that device have to have in order for it to satisfy your request. And so in the example that we're seeing here, I'm basically just saying that associated with this device class, it has to have the driver name of gpu.nvidia.com, which means that if I have a resource slice associated with gpu.nvidia.com, any of the devices that are listed in that resource slice can be matched by this device class. So, you know, for all intents and purposes with, with this one, I would have a bunch of GPUs, GPU 0, GPU 1, GPU 2, and so on. And then if a user put a request in for the specific device class, the scheduler would be free to allocate any of those devices to me if no extra criteria was, was specified. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of actually uh, making use of this from the, from the consumer side. Um, so at the top, I'm creating a resource claim, which I'm calling shared GPU. I'm then associating this resource claim with this gpu.nvidia.com uh, resource class, which I just showed on the last slide, which, you know, given the example that I showed, would allow the scheduler to allocate any of the devices that were in a slice that was associated with this driver. And then at the bottom, I have a pod, um, which has this new section at the bottom called resource claims, which has a reference back to that top level resource claim object. It has a local name associated with that called GPU, and then any of the containers that I want to have access to the shared GPU just reference uh, that resource claim by that local name. And under the hood, they're getting shared access to the exact same underlying GPU. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, one of the main advantages of this over something that like the device plugin could give you is that you get fine-grained control of how you share these GPUs, right? Um, because you know that when you reference that, you're actually running on the exact same piece of hardware that's been bound to that claim. Um, this isn't necessarily just within a single pod. You can do this across pods. So this you know, top-level resource claim object can both be referenced in the resource claim section of two separate pods. And then you, in the containers associated with those pods, they just have a reference to the local name. And they, once again, are running on the same underlying uh, GPU that's been bound to that claim. 
Um, I don't show it in, in these slides at all, but one important thing to note is that uh, resource claims are um, within a specific namespace. So if you have a resource claim created in one namespace, it can't be used in another namespace. And so it adds an extra level of, um, um, of security in terms of who actually can access the resource claims that you've had, or the GPUs that you've had bound to one of the resource claims that you've created. Um, <clears throat> so going back to this example I showed about uh, with the device class that has this cell expression saying that you know, if, you get it, if you ask for a GPU from the gpu.nvidia.com device class, you will get any of the devices that are associated with that. Um, you, in addition to you know, just having that, uh, that GPU uh, granted to you, you can also configure that device that's been given to you in, in, in a certain way. And so um, what I'm showing here in the example on the right is that um, um, at the bottom there, you can see that you know, I have a uh, request uh, for gpu.nvidia.com. The request's name, local name, is called GPU. And then in a new section called config, there is a reference to this, uh, the GPU that you've been given access to, and um, a set of configuration uh, parameters that can be applied to that GPU so that when it's actually granted to you, it's set up, in this example, um, using this technology that we have called MPS, to give each client that happens to reference this shared GPU uh, dedicated access to 10 gigabytes of memory and 20% of active compute on, on that GPU. And so you can imagine that you know, if you have two different um, um, clients that, that, that reference this shared GPU, they're each going to get 10 gigabytes, and there's still, um, I think this was a 96 gigabyte GPU, so there's still going to be you know, just under 70 gigabytes available to, to the others. Other clients that may attach to it as well. Um, a more complex example uh, that, that goes through some of this, uh, these, uh, this new alignment functionality that we have built in, um, uh, I'm going to show now. Uh, in this example, it's, I'm calling it the big GPU with an aligned NIC, um, where I can put in a request for uh, a GPU device for the, from, the driver, or from the device class gpu.nvidia.com, and I'm going to add extra selection criteria to that, um, which says that I want to have not just any GPU from the gpu.nvidia.com device class, but specifically one that has at least 80 gigabytes of memory. It's a little bit convoluted syntax here, but because we're bound to doing this via cell expressions, this is uh, how making a request like that would look. Um, additionally, I want to put in a separate request within this same claim uh, for a, a NIC from the hypothetical rdma.nvidia.com driver. And specifically, I want a, um, uh, an RDMA virtual function to be allocated from that. And then on top of that, I can add this extra section called constraints, which says that for the GPU and NIC devices that I've made requests for, I want to make sure that they're aligned on the same PCIe root complex. And so you could imagine that both of these devices were advertised in the resource slice with this exact same attribute set to the same value um, uh, in that resource slice. And so the scheduler can use this information to make sure that when it makes a decision on what GPU and what NIC should I bind to this claim, it will make sure that they come uh, from devices that have this same, uh, same value for the attribute that you're matching there. Um, <clears throat> uh, so one thing that's kind of interesting to point out is that you know, we, we talked about having classic DRA versus this new model based on structured parameters. Um, and even when we made that initial switch from classic DRA to structured parameters, uh, I wrote this document called NVIDIA GPU Use Cases for Dynamic Resource Allocation. Um, and we already covered six out of 12 of the initial use cases that we had. Um, control GPU sharing was supported, GPU selection via complex constraints, multiple GPU types per node, you know, all the ones that you see listed here. But there was still, you know, half of them weren't, weren't supported. Um, in 131, we were actually able to add, you know, three more of these, of these 12 use cases. Uh, and by 133, we plan to have all but one of them supported, where the last one is really hard to support in general and probably most likely never will be. Um, but one thing I want to highlight uh, just really quickly is a new use case that was kind of um, identified af after the point in time when I wrote that initial document is that um, with the new GB200 systems that we have coming out, there's this notion of something called multi-node NVLink associated with them. Um, and in order to make use of multi-node NVLink, 
you have to actually allocate a non-node local resource to allow a GPU on one node to securely communicate with a GPU on another node over this high bandwidth in VLink. And DRA enables this use case, whereas there's no other in-tree native primitive, you know, kind of Kubernetes native way to do this. Um, and so it's just an interesting use case, especially because it's one of the first concrete use cases we have for non-node local resources. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about this at the Google booth on Friday um, in conjunction with, with, a, with a bunch of other people, um, um, uh, specifically as it pertains to, to GKE. Um, there's also a bunch of other uh, talks that we have uh, related to DRA at this conference. Um, there's one later this afternoon um, at 325, a tale of two drivers, GPU reconfiguration on the fly using DRA. It's another, some of my colleagues here at NVIDIA have um, expanded the initial GPU driver that, that I wrote uh, to add additional, to, to support additional use cases, uh, specifically as it pertains to GeForce Now. Um, I'm also giving a talk tomorrow, uh, which GPU sharing strategy is right for you, where we go through a comprehensive benchmark study to help you figure out how and why you should use a given um, GPU sharing strategy using the different techniques I talked about with DRA earlier uh, in this talk. Um, there's also a talk on Friday from John and Patrick, um, Better Together GPU, TPU, and NIC Topology Alignment. Um, it kind of walks through in more detail some of the, the, the more details of that last example that I showed where you can do alignment between GPUs, NICs, and other types of devices. Uh, and then the last one is the, talk, is the, the booth talk that I just mentioned in the, in the previous slide. Um, so yeah, uh, QGAR code here on the right uh, to give us feedback, uh, and we're happy to answer uh, any questions in the next uh, three to four minutes that we have. Thank you. Hi, so, um, I'm a potential DRA driver developer, and I see... Can you, can you speak a little more closely to the... Yeah, um, I'm potential DRA driver developer. Maybe I'm going to work on in your future, but I'm curious about CDI implementation. Um, Intel, no, I mean, NVIDIA uh, open sourced their CDI implementation but I cannot find any other real world example from Google's or Intel's. So there are definitely Intel DRA drivers. If you get the PD CDI is talking. Uh, CDI, okay, oh sorry. Um, Good. You also have CDI stuff, right? Well, we are certainly using CDI. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, that is the underlying technology that we are expecting from the container runtime. Uh, we how it works is that the kubelet plugin, the DRA driver, gives the kubelet a CDI device ID string. We are passing that into the container runtime through CRI. And we are expecting that then the container runtime injects those devices or whatever is specified in the CDI file into the uh, container. And that works with container D and it works with cryo. Uh, support for other runtimes, if, if relevant, certainly would be welcome. But that's the current focus that we have. Your, your driver has to understand how to map those device IDs back to whatever it, it, the, 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 the claim and, and the, the device um, as it's represented inside your driver. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, I have a question on the... I have a question on the DRA. What are your thoughts on DRA for... Um, not CPU topology, but more of backend network topology um, with the multiple hierarchies of networking that's going to be introduced in the new architectures. So I, I couldn't quite follow. I, C, CPU is actually the talk, the, the first one on there that's today. They are using DRA for CPU to, um, uh, topology. For n network topology, is that what you said? Are the, you talking the about? The backend networking, like the uh, NVLink, getting into the NICs. Switches and we switch. Yeah, we can represent that as in the in the metadata, and and it's certainly something we're interested in. So, um, you know, it'd be great if we can talk afterwards, or if you want to come to one of our meetings, we can have a, um, uh, you can present your use cases, and we can we can take a look at it. Thank you. I think we're just about out of time, but we can I, maybe. I think we can take the last question. Squeeze one more question in. 
Thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. I have other questions about the alignment features. That is very um, very interesting to me. Um, you have the constraint to make sure that, the, for example, the need the GPU is in the same um, node. Is that decide uh, the scheduler's part to make sure that um, you will schedule the uh, job or the pod to the node that available for both NICs and GPU, right? And is it the decisions also like um, reflect at the time of the scheduling, like after the scheduling or for the next job, if you never allocate for the same node? Okay, that's just my question. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah, work. The, the scheduler tracks the devices and allocates them in DRA. In okay. device plugin, it doesn't, and so you run into some race conditions potentially in that case. But okay. with DRA, it should work. That's great. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks.